Well, Mark Chandler, it's been nothing but big fight weeks for you since you came to the UFC. Here's another one, I guess. Uh, what's, what's the feeling like this time around? Man, this is what I asked for. You know, I wanted to, uh, fighting so long outside the UFC, I always dreamt of, of coming here, putting on, putting on performances on the biggest stage possible under the brightest lights. And uh, that's exactly what they gave me. I asked for it when I first sat down with Hunter Campbell, um, laid out my intentions of what I wanted to be for the organization and inside of the organization. And uh, here we are. I mean, the strength of schedule that I put together in 16 months with the backup for the title fight, Dan Hooker, Charles Oliveira, Justin Gaethje, and now Tony Ferguson, it's, uh, it's right where I wanted to be. You know, big, fa big fights, big stages, and this is no different. And uh, I got a tough opponent ahead of me on Saturday night, ready to do the thing. I wonder as you sit there now, like how you would categorize your UFC run, because exactly what you just said, right? I insane strength of schedule outstanding performances, right? But if you look at just the results, I know you have high expectations for yourself. So can you be proud of what you've accomplished or do you sit back and go like, yeah, but I didn't do what I wanted to do? No, absolutely. I, uh, I gave up trying to be perfect long ago. You know, when I got into this sport, I watched, watched BJ Penn and Matt Hughes and George St. Pierre and Anderson Silva, all these guys that we looked up to in mixed martial arts. And they all had losses on their record, but at the time they were so dominant that they hardly ever lost. So in my mind, I said, okay, well, I'm not going to lose. There's no reason for me to lose. I'm going to be that good. Then you go through a couple of losses. You grow through failure. You grow through struggle, and you realize, hey, it's all part of the process. You know, me coming in, and you look at my record thus far, one and two in the UFC, fighting the toughest guys on the planet at 155 pounds. Every single one of these guys and gals on the roster on any given night could lose to anybody on the roster, especially in the top ten when you're fighting the toughest guys or gals in the world. So um, it's uh, the cards have fallen how they were. I'm not too upset about a debut of the year starting 2021 and then a fight of the year capping it off at the end. Um, two awards that I hold dear to my heart and uh, go out there, get my hair, hand raised on, on Saturday night, and there's even more big fights coming up in the future. Absolutely. Uh, Tony Ferguson is a big fight. Uh, you know, he had the, the famous Dana White privilege line. We all got a big kick out of it. Everybody laughed. And then we brought it up to him today, and he doesn't find it so funny anymore. It seems like he's got a little chip on his shoulder, maybe a little anger towards the organization, I think, but maybe a little bit towards you as well. Um, what, do you, what do you make of that? I'm sorry, Tony, but that Dana White privilege line might be the funniest thing that has ever been said on a microphone in the context of mixed martial arts. Um, I, he's right. I am his boss's favorite fighter. I am Dana's favorite fighter. Dana White Privilege is not on the line here. I'm, I've already got it. And uh, no, man, it's uh, it's all fun. You know, I saw him after the after the press conference. It's all respect. He's going to go out there and and try to take my head off, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. But when it comes to animosity, I got I got no animosity towards him. Um, he's all business. Is it is it true? Is it blunder? Is it just words? Is it lip service? We don't know. Um, all I know is he's going to run into a buzzsaw on Saturday night, and my Dan and White privilege is, is it not going to make a difference no matter what. Last thing for me, I mean, obviously your track record speaks for itself, but are you thinking about rankings and title shots and what comes next, or is this all about this point about just coming in and you know turning in these fan-friendly, amazing performances and then just seeing what comes next? Man, yeah, I'm always looking at the future. I'm always looking at the game. I'm a student of, of the game, and now I'm a student of, of the lightweight division here in the UFC, how all the pieces are falling together how um, how people are, are in the rankings, who's out of the rankings, who are coming in, who is moving weight classes. There's a bunch of different stuff going on. But I, uh, I truthfully think that everything in the fight business is up to time and circumstance. The reason I got the title shot back in May was the – interesting set of circumstances where Connor and Poirier were tied up for a third fight. Habib retires in steps me and Charles Oliveira. Now there's a going to be a scenario on Saturday night where one of the two men in the main event win, win the fight and either retain the title or win the title. And there's not an MMA fan alive that doesn't want to see me rematch either of those guys, Charles Oliveira and especially Justin Gaethje in a five round title fight. So we'll see what happens. Um, all I know is I can take care of business on Saturday night I'll break bread with Dana and Hunter, and we'll, we'll talk about what's next. Mike, I wonder, I mean, pretty much the entire six years that Tony Ferguson was looked at as either the number two or number three lightweight in the world, you were over in Bellator, you were winning titles, you were doing a lot of stuff over there. Was, was this a fight that you ever daydreamed about in your spare time or thought about or even just used this, this guy as a barometer for your own performances while you were over there? Yeah, I, I made the decision that I was going to test free agency and, and hopefully most likely end up in – the UFC right when the pandemic hit and two months straight, I trained in my garage every single day 
with UFC Fight Pass on, watching every single lightweight, every single minute of every single one of their fights in the UFC. And Tony Ferguson was at the top of the division, you know, at that time when he was kind of going going through right off the end of that 12-fight win streak. Still a guy who was looked at as the, one of the top lightweights in the world in a lot of people's eyes could have beat Habib. Um, Tony Ferguson was the first name on our list that we wanted to fight when we came over to the UFC. He turned down the fight and then offered to fight me like a month after Fight Island. I just wasn't ready. I'm, I'm away from my family. I needed to go spend time with them, date my wife, and serve my child. Um, and now here we are a year and a half later, and it happens. Tony Ferguson has been the guy I've wanted to fight since the very beginning. Now we get to do it on Saturday night. Yeah, and I think we're all looking forward to it. I mean, you're you're always extraordinarily open and honest with us in the media and the fans. And so I'm just curious for your honest assessment. I mean, where do you think Tony is at this point in his career? I don't know. He's probably in the hotel somewhere over here. No, I think uh, – no, I mean, where is he? I mean, he's uh, – Man, the thing about Tony Ferguson is you can talk about he's lost a step. You can talk about maybe he's lost athleticism or power because of age or whatnot. Yes, he's fallen on some hard times with a couple losses. But just as I said before, when you're fighting the toughest guys on the planet at 155 pounds, you're going to take losses. Um, the thing that makes Tony scary, the reason he is the boogeyman in El Kikui, is he's so unorthodox and so unpredictable. Not a man alive can can emulate Tony Ferguson in my training. There's nobody at Sanford MMA, which I highly regard as the greatest gym on the planet with the greatest coaches. They really can't 100% prepare me for Tony Ferguson because you don't know what you're going to get. What we saw last fight was not what we saw the fight before, and it will not be what we see on Saturday night. It's a crapshoot, and that's why everybody's going to be on the edge of their seat and might I say, dare to say that we're going to steal the show again. I mean, do you feel like this fight almost represents, in a way, his last chance to do this t sort of title run and be in contention? And in a way, does that make him more dangerous, right? You're getting someone who doesn't have much to lose. I, I will I will, I will, will say I do think he's probably going to be at his most dangerous because you back a guy up into a wall, he's going to come out swinging, especially a guy with a champion heart like Tony Ferguson. Um, I don't think this is an end-all, be-all you know, fail in its in its final type of scenario. I don't think we're talking about retirement for him after I beat him. I don't think we're talking, you know, this is his last fight. I think Tony Ferguson, and in the sport of mixed martial arts, when you got a big of a name as a fan friendly and a fan favorite as, as Tony Ferguson is, and have the, has the following that he has, he's a he's still a large piece of this promotion at the at the lightweight division. He's a he's a guy who puts butts in seats and guy a guy that people want to watch fight. So. He's uh, he's got a, a career as long as he wants to have it. Um, I, he will he will lose on Saturday night, in my opinion. But he'll uh, we'll see what what happens after that for him. Well, last thing for me, I mean, you, you were talking about how hard it is to prepare for a guy like him. You can't get anybody to replicate his style in, in training. Is there anyone you can compare him to throughout your own resume, like a fighter you fought who you think may be somewhat similar, or anything you can sort of reach to with that? No, I, I, I really don't. I mean, you know, obviously everybody's got two arms and two legs and we're talking about boxing, kickboxing, jujitsu and, and grappling. And uh, so, of course, there's different similarities here and there. But I think when you add when you add in the, the wrinkle that that Tony Ferguson doesn't get tired, he doesn't get finished, you know, he keeps on coming. That's a scary fight. He's got elbows that'll cut you up. He throws them from everywhere. He he keeps fighting off of his back when he does get taken down. Um, I can't think of anybody that that can emulate Tony Ferguson because nobody can. You know, he's he's uh, he's a puzzle to solve, and we're going to try to solve it on Saturday night. Michael, Justin was in here a minute ago, and he said that his fight with you wasn't a war. Are you kind of surprised that he describes it like that? Yeah, listen, I like Justin Gaethje, but I got I to gotta call him out on the, some of the things that he said. Number one, he said it was boring. Number two, he said um, it wasn't a close fight. And number three, he said it was the first time that he fought somebody to win instead of fought somebody to hurt him. Now, that to me is very telling. It's very indicative of a guy who met his match, a guy who stood across the cage from somebody who – he was afraid afraid for the first time in his life a little bit to engage with because he knew he met a guy as crazy as he was. All of those things are very telling to me that he wasn't where he wanted to be mentally because I put him in a place where he didn't want to be mentally. I love you, Justin. I respect the heck out of you as a competitor. I want to share the octagon with you for the title by the end of the year after this fight if you win. But it, it was definitely a lot closer than he thinks it was. 
outside of fighting, you're getting a bit of reputation as a motivational speaker. <laughs> I saw uh, earlier this week how to truly order a cup of coffee. Yep. I'm curious what you think of that reputation. Feel free to answer it in a motivational speaker. No, I uh, no, it's it's. Uh, I don't take myself too seriously, man. I don't. I th- I have fun with this. I uh, I love. I love these opportunities because people get to see it. People get to see what we're saying or hear what we're saying and see what we're doing and, and they get to feel something. Um, so I like to, I like to use my platform to, to speak on my experience, to, to, uh, convey a message and tell a story. And, uh, I, I like to have fun on social media. I love that people have fun with it. You know, the, the, uh, Michael Chandler motivational stuff on all the YouTube comments is actually pretty hilarious, but it's also, I think, um, somewhat of a compliment. I think, uh, I think it hits home for a lot of people, and then a lot of people make fun of it. But people will always criticize things that they don't understand and things that they are intimidated by. What's your favorite motivational quote? Uh, favorite motivational quote is Steve Prefontaine, to give anything less than your best is a sacrifice the gifts. Hey, Michael, over here uh, to your left. Uh, oh, yeah. Where's gonna... your microphone? Oh, right there. Oh, okay, I was going to say, I was like, okay. Uh, can you just talk to me about your family's recent decision to adopt another child? Like, what does that mean to you? Oh, man, it was, uh, I, I got to be honest with you. You know, I, I have not even been there. You know, we, uh, we went out to uh, where our son was located um, during training camp, right, August 12th or April 12th or 13th or whatever to go to go get him. And uh, since then, I spent a couple of days in a hospital, a couple of days in a hotel room. And then I've been down in, in Florida training. So I've been, you know, FaceTiming my wife as she is going through the toils of, of uh, taking care of a newborn. So I feel like I haven't even been there yet. Number one, to serve my wife and be there to help her. Number two, to uh, serve my oldest son, Hap, who is now going to be, you know, a, not an only child anymore. So there's, I got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of catching up to do. As soon as I get my hand raised on Saturday night, I got to get home and be a, be a father to two baby boys and, and serve and love my wife who's been taking care of our household. But it's, it's amazing. I love my family. I love, um, I love the gift of adoption. I love my son, Hap. I love my new son, Ace. And I can't wait for the future to, to raise these two young men into high-functioning members of society. Is a father of two Michael Chandler going to be more dangerous than father of one Michael Chandler? <laughs> You know, I think I, I think maybe more next fight once I actually fall in love with my new son and 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 take on that take on that that fatherly role and, and not that I haven't yet that might sound bad but I just I haven't been able to haven't been able to take myself out of fighter Michael and put myself into father Michael quite yet a father or two yet so it's all happened so fast you know you want to you want to make God laugh you tell him you tell him your plans. And he's gonna he's gonna supersede your expectations and and change your plans every single time. I, you know, it was prepar- precarious timing for him to be born a couple two or three weeks before my fight. But um, I'm dangerous no matter what, man. Y'all have seen me perform. I, I like to go out there and bite down my mouthpiece and have a good time. And um, I definitely got an- another why, a little extra wrinkle in my game, a little bit a little bit of extra love in my heart. Michael, right here. Uh, looking at your Eddie Alvarez fight, I mean, Eddie Alvarez, um, Justin Gagey fight, uh, in, the, in the countdown it said you kind of like fell into it, like the crowd was kind of erupting and you got into that war. For t- Against Tony Ferguson, it doesn't seem like it matters who he fights. They're going to get booed regardless because Tony Ferguson is such a fan favorite. Have you had to do anything in camp to prepare or just get your mind so you don't fall into that trap of the fans around you? No, I haven't, but I, I will say that. that I mean, I remember, uh, I remember how big of a support he had in May uh, when I fought – Oliveira for the title. Um, the dude's got a following, and his following travels. So I, uh, I expect there to be a, you know, and it's the fact that it's Arizona. Obviously, there's going to be a, a a Mexican heritage Cinco de Mayo too. Cinco de Mayo, you know. So turns out I'm going to, uh, yeah, enemy territory. I didn't even realize that till just now. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, no, but I, I just. Uh, you know, competition to me, hand-to-hand combat is, is the same, whether it's, you know, in front of a couple hundred people at the Hearn Center back in Missouri uh, or uh, at these sold-out arenas. I'm going to go out there and, and do what I do best. I know you said you hope to fight Justin for the title by the end of the year. Is that your official pick for the main event? You think Justin is going to win? God, it's so hard to uh, pick against Justin Gaethje, but Charles Oliveira keeps on superseding all of our expectations. It's hard to make a pick. If I had to be a betting man and put money on it, I would say Justin Gaethje gets the slight edge just because he can push for so hard for 25 minutes. We know he's going to be able to do that. So um, 
that would be my official pick. And yeah, I think there's no MMA fan on the planet that doesn't want to watch me fight Justin Gaethje by the end of the year for the title. Hey, Michael over here. Uh, you've been speaking a lot about Tony's erratic striking patterns, and you've said multiple times how no uh, training partner could exactly emulate what he brings to the table. So how do you possibly prepare for someone as unpredictable as Tony Ferguson is? It's a good question, and I, I answer it how I always answer everything. When, when most people ask about opponents and film study and, and how much time is allotted towards my own um, increasing of my skills and how much focused on the opponent, I, I always focus 80 to 90% on myself. How does Michael Chandler become a better athlete, a more dangerous striker, a more dangerous grappler, in shape, strong, fast, athletic? How do I use my attributes to fight anybody and beat anybody on the planet? And then that last 10, 20% focus on small little habits and tendencies and idiosyncrasies of, of the opponent. We've watched Tony's tape. Um, it's impressive in, in so many different ways. And as you said, it, it's erratic and it's unpredictable. Um, so that's kind of the, the fun thing about this fight. Expect the unexpected and go out there and just – be comfortable not knowing what is coming next. Be comfortable and have no expectations of how the fight is going to play out. Go out there and, and, and have fun and be confident in my skill set, and I get my hand raised. And uh, lastly, uh, going off what you just said, you often speak about uh, setting yourself apart from the rest in regards to your training regimen or other lightweights in the division. So what are some things you do on a daily basis that differentiate you from the pack? Man, I think I honestly, I've been, I've trained on the East Coast, West Coast, and everywhere in between. I'm telling you right now, no, nobody lives the lifestyle that I live. And I'm 36 years old, and I'm competing at an extremely high level because of it. Why has my body lasted so long? It's great supplementation. It's great sleep. It's taking care of my body and treating myself like a professional athlete. And then inside of the training sessions, going harder than everyone else, doing the extra stuff. Um, and then taking, taking care of my body through body work and myofascial release on my roller every single day. The body will perform and last so much longer than we give it credit for if you give it the right tools and you give it the right, the right love that it deserves. Um, so I just go harder than everyone else. My standard for hard work is much higher than anybody else that has sat in this chair, um, and I will put that, I will put that on everything. Um, so that's what I've done, and I don't like to get out of shape, so I stay in shape, and uh, that's why it's lasted so long. Got one here Michael. in the back left. Michael, your run so far here in the UFC has been ultra exciting. Have the fights and your time with the organization lived up to the expectations you had when you signed? It's exceeded my expectations. You know, you, uh, I think when you're, when you're outside the UFC, you have this view of what it might be to be over there in the UFC, um, and it has exceeded my expectations. Um, the bright lights, the platform, the, the ability to um, have a voice and, and a platform is, is, is what I've always wanted. I've always felt like I was underutilized and under underappreciated for the amount of work that I put in and the amount of and the amount of skill that I had. You know, going back to the, that gentleman's question, I've treated this training camp and every every other training camp in my entire life like it was the most important training camp of my life. I fought some very sub subpar fighters compared to my abilities, and I always trained as if I was fighting the number one guy in the world. So to not get the the recognition for that was hard at times knowing I was underappreciated and that's why I spend as much time as I can on this microphone and spend as much time as I can in front of these cameras because I'm making up for lost time and I love my life and I love my job. We knew you as a long time as the face of Bellator. Do you feel now at home as a UFC fighter? Well, I am Dana's favorite fighter. Uh, so no, I, I do, you know, and, and I think uh, every, it, it always, there's always a transition period. First, they, uh, they doubt you. Then they kind of hate on you and doubt you at the same time, and then they, they, they start to embrace you. And that was – the mixed martial arts fans are, are amazing fans, but they are very rigid at times. And I was just a – I was a nobody who had to come in and prove myself. And here we are 16 months into it, and I've asked for the hardest, the hardest fights and the biggest names in the sport – not many guys want to go out there and fight Justin Gaethje for a second time. Not many guys want to go out there and call out Conor McGregor, not because of the money, not because of the red paint and that, because they want the, the legacy fight and the stage and the significance of, of that fight. I want all the smoke. I want all the big fights. I want all the big names. I want all the big stages. And that's what the UFC can give you that other organizations cannot.
I'm right at home, and I'm I'm 100% a UFC fighter, and people are starting to accept that. And you previously had also said you were here for a good time, not for a long time. Are you seeing more and more options? So maybe extending the period of time you may be here. Yeah, I've always said I always said that too because I wanted people to know I ain't no spring chicken. I didn't come into this organization as a 24 year old. I came into this organization as a 34 year old seasoned veteran, and here I am celebrating my 36th birthday a couple week, weeks ago, and I still feel great. Um, I still got some huge fights on my horizon. Um, I do believe I will be UFC champion by the time I hang up the gloves. And uh, I think that's sooner rather than later. Thank you. Michael, just to you, right. Um, we had Donald Cerrone in earlier today, and he became very emotional talking about the prospect of fighting in front of his child on Saturday. I know your oldest, Hap, will be watching you live for the first time on Saturday. Can you put into words how special that will be? Um, I've tried not to think about it. Honestly, you know, um, you know, it's, it's like, you know, take, take yourself back to Madison Square Garden. You take yourself back to title fights. You take yourself back to these, these experiences that have bigger implications than just the fight, you know. Um, the huge platform of Madison Square Garden or getting to fight for a title, um, those things can get inside of your head and make you, make you fight differently. When I know my son Hap is there, and my wife, you know, two of my favorite heartbeats on the entire planet. It's, uh, I don't want to think about it too much because I got a job to do and I just want to get my hand raised. I want to jump out, out of that cage and I want to go hug him and tell him that, uh, I, that I'm ready to be home and I'm ready to be daddy because he deserves that. Um, and I fell in love with him five years ago and I looked into his eyes and told him that I was going to love him and serve him and take care of him. And this sport that I love takes me away from him at times, but he will know that every man has to work. And for him to sit there at the fr- in the front row and to be able to see what Daddy does for work, I think that's going to be that's going to be really cool. Um, so I'm excited about it and uh, try not to think about it too much. So thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Mike, there's just one here to your left. Close it out. Um, mm-hmm. I know you said in the past you know, two fights that you zigged when you should have zagged, and that's kind of the difference between winning and losing. Um, is there anything you can do going into this fight to clean that up? I know it's chaotic in there. I know decisions happen in a split second, but is that something you've thought about that you can change, or is it something that just kind of happens? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's the why we love this sport, man. Every single fight is different, and every single moment could be catastrophic for yourself or your opponent. And that's why we love the sport. Um, I am confident in my skill set. I'm confident where I am, where I am exactly right now. I'm confident in some of the things that I've cleaned up from from previous performances. I am confident where my head is at, where my heart is at, and where I'm at physically. So, um, not a lot I can do besides just be me. The good thing is, I know I have the no quit gene in me. I have the the warrior gene inside of me. We all saw it last fight. We've seen it in numerous fights. It's something you can't teach. You can't teach grit, you can't teach heart, you can't teach determination, you can't teach toughness. And I have those things in droves. So Saturday night, I want you guys to see the uh, the technical side of me. And if I have to pull out that dog inside me, I will. Thank you guys, appreciate it.